Professor Pedro Domingos, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Washington. He is the author of The Master Algorithm. And let me tell you a little bit about that book. That book has been one of the most influential books in artificial intelligence. When the Chinese Premier Xi Jinping was talking about AI for the first time, he had the master algorithm on the wall behind him. You've heard of NVIDIA, of course, when the CEO of NVIDIA, Zhuang Hanseng, was first talking about artificial intelligence and thinking about pivoting NVIDIA to artificial intelligence. Well, the master algorithm was one of the books that he asked everyone to read. So, Pedro Domingos, after that build-up, it's great to have you with us. Um, and by the way, the stories are all correct, right, about the master algorithm, both Xi Jinping and Juan Hansen getting everyone to read the book before they started pivoting to AI? Oh, yeah, it's true. I mean, he both told me he was doing it, and, and several NVIDIA employees have come to me since saying, like, oh, you're the author of the master algorithm, that's what I read, and uh, it's kind of fun. About a year ago, I did speak to you just after ChatGPT had come, and I, I'm going to repeat that exercise today to try and get a sense of where we are you know, a year or so later. Uh, at that time, we did feel a lot of revolution was now coming to the, to the world of AI. How do you think this one year has gone? Is it as per your expectations, more or less than what you thought would happen? In a way, it's been what we were speculating would happen. Clearly, there was something taking off then, and it has taken off now. We've seen 10 years of progress in terms of the growth of the industry around AI. There's, you know, back then it was uh, ChatGPT and a few other things. And now there really is a whole industry. There are, there are hundreds of startups. Every major player, both in tech and in other companies, has its own chatbot or its own uses for, for chatbots. Uh, there's an enormous amount of money going into this and an enormous number of people going into this. There's also a lot of, you know, problems and grumblings of dissatisfaction and people saying there's a bubble, which maybe there is. So we are now full tilt in this uh, AI boom, if you will, and it'll be interesting to see what's happened a year from now. You know, one of the other areas that I think a lot of people are finding AI incredibly useful, it could be one of the areas of positive disruption, is also in the field of education. I mean, you could argue that GPT-4, chat GPT, are the most patient and helpful tutors you could have if you're trying to learn something. It'll teach you with infinite patience. Well, so, good example. Uh, I think generative AI and AI more generally are going to uh, seriously disrupt and improve education. And, you know, there's a real need for that. And, for example, uh, Khan Academy has this thing called Khan Migo, which is an agent based on ChatGPT that, you know, on the surface is actually incredibly helpful. But on the other hand, if, you, if it's helping you with math, often you get the sums right and it gets them wrong. So as a teacher, it's very, this is a good example. As a teacher, it's very unreliable but teachers can rely on it as a helper. So I think that's what we're going to see. And I think looking forward, the important thing is like, there's gonna be a lot of progress in some areas and that will directly benefit, you know, uh, uh, areas like education that are some of the harder ones. There will also be areas where honestly, I think it's hard to see how LLMs will overcome their problems, like the problem of hallucinations. So the current AI technology is not enough to build a reliable teacher, is, is good enough to build a good teacher's helper. Maybe in a few years, we will have a reliable teacher and that, that will be a revolution of another or the magnitude entirely. So let's just stay with the good aspects of AI for a minute or two. LLMs that you were just talking about are just one aspect of, of AI. Now, because there's been so much hype around ChatGPT, everyone seems to think that AI is essentially LLMs. But obviously, there's a lot more to it. People are using AI in other ways. For example, in, in, in the corporate world, how do you fix something, create digital models, model all sorts of things. Other than LLMs, what are the areas of AI that you think we've seen a lot of dramatic progress in and where dramatic impact is going to start to be seen very soon? Well, machine learning for the last 20 years uh, has been what's been driving progress across all of AI. And your typical machine learning application is learning to predict something. For example, I give you a database of medical records of you know, symptoms of patients and, and the diagnosis, and the system learns to do it by itself. Right. So if you think of all the possible applications of prediction across all of business, there are a lot. In fact, one good way to think about AI is that it just makes prediction very cheap. Like, for example, the biggest impact today of AI by far is in recommending things to people. Products to buy. A search engine is recommending links to click on. Amazon 
uh, you know, Netflix, movies, uh, Spotify, music, Twitter, Facebook, they all use AI to predict what they want to show to you. And that really today is the killer app of AI. Well, the other thing I think a lot of people use is uh, Google Maps and other such apps that tell you how to get from point A to point B. That's also AI, but all of that is narrow AI. It's not generalized AI in any way. No, no, precisely so. Uh, a very good point. Free large language models, uh, all the important applications of AI were narrow in some sense. And LLMs in, are really the first AI application that is broad and, and also very important that people know that they're interacting with AI. Most people when using a search engine or Google Maps have no idea that there's AI under the hood. But with JetGPT for the first time, they're conscious that they're talking to an AI and this is going to, you know, I think be very healthy for people to have a better understanding of what AI really is and isn't and how to work with it. Well, that was one of my outrider visions for what could happen with AI a few years down, is people turning to AI more and more for companionship, for friendship, then perhaps even for romantic relations. You know, people having AI girlfriends created with them, somebody who's always kind and considerate and never argues, always loving. Is that something you think could happen? That, that is already happening. There are people, even like there's this company called Character.ai that will create the personalities that you want for you. There are people who actually are uh, using chatbots of their loved ones that died to interact with them. And again, already 10 years ago, there was this, you know, uh, uh, Microsoft chatbot in China called Zhao Weiss that has the persona of a teenage girl that 40 million teenage boys said they were in love with. <laughs> so this is already happening now. You, you don't even have to wait 10 years. All right, let's now focus a little bit more on the negative aspects of AI. Now, one aspect, of course, that uh, is coming very much to the fore right now and is very much capturing headlines is uh, things like bias. Now, with Google and the debacle around uh, Germany, the entire question of AI and bias and wrong conclusions and hallucinations. Now, I think everyone thought that the bias would be somewhat different to what's actually happening with Germany, uh, reverse racism, if you like, but it shows you some of the problems that could happen. So that and possibly job loss. Are those the two most immediate negative impacts that we are seeing? Well, uh, to tackle bias to begin with, um, the thing that everybody has to realize is that a chatbot is not some magically objective computer system. It is the product of the people who made it and is serving their goals. And Google, I think what happened, Google, I think should be a lesson for everybody is that Google Technically, it's a super savvy company. They're really the best in AI. But politically, it's dominated by a very narrow clique of, of people who you may agree or disagree with, but you should realize that the answers that you get from Gemini are the answers that those people wanted to see. You know, I'm not really sure that they wanted to see the founding fathers of America as being African-American or kings and queens of Britain being black. I'm not sure that's what they really wanted. No, let me clarify, right? Uh, in fact, the first part of the answer to that, you'd be surprised to what extent they actually wanted to see that because that's how crazy they are. The problem is that, the, and this again will happen a lot with AI, is that, I mean, what they, what they told the system to do was like, you know, generate images of people of varied races, not just white. Right? And then what happened is that, and again, we don't know the details of this, but I can well imagine, the system basically refuses to generate white people except when you're asking for shoplifters when they're all white, <laughs> right? And so what happened, and like, they, they didn't think of the problem that like, if I now ask for a, a king of England, it, it needs to turn the diversity off, right? And that's when you get a black king of England, a black woman as a king of England and, and, and so on, right? But the thing is like, in a way the system was doing exactly what it told was, was told to do, only to an extent that no one imagined. And this is gonna happen a lot across the board, right? It's the, apprentice, it's the sorcerer's apprentice problem. So in a way they just got more than they had bargained for. All right, Professor Domingos, let me turn at the end then to something that you and I did debate a year ago. Look, this is all fine. This is all narrow AI. It is still not at the level of human intelligence. But there is a concern that many, many people have. And they say that, look, there will be a day when AI could get to human level intelligence. I don't know how far out that is. It could be five years, 10 years, 20 years. But at that point, you run the risk that artificial intelligence will go from human level intelligence to super intelligence really fast. 
and when it becomes super intelligent is more powerful than us and then you have the risk for example of extinction you could have the risk of a super intelligent AI system wiping out mankind now what is your thinking on that particular risk today Okay, so first of all, we have to distinguish the short term and the long term. In the short term, AI is going to give us a lot of productivity gains. It's not going to cause a lot of job losses. It's just like previous forms of automations where everybody worried it's going to be a jobs apocalypse, and then you end up with more jobs in the occupations that it was automated because the, the cost of intelligence has been lowered, and so there's more demand for it. There's more bank tellers now than there were before uh, there were ATMs, for example. Now, in the long run, I do believe, and it's hard to say exactly when the long run is, it's not next year, but it could be 10 or 100 or, or 1,000. Uh, I think it's almost inevitable that AI will get to a point where it can do every job better than humans and robots. And now the, 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 the thing that people worry about there is, but will it take control from us? And again, this is a false worry because people are projecting onto AI the motives and the emotions and the consciousness and, the, and all of that of humans. And AI can be infinitely powerful and still completely under our control. It's, it's solving intractable problems efficiently whose solutions we can check and monitor. So again, the question, even when AI is very powerful, is who controls it? Not that the AI is suddenly going to decide to kill people. Well, Professor Domingos, I guess that's a debate and a question that we'll have to keep running because the other side of that particular argument is that a super intelligent system, 30 times more powerful than you or a million times more powerful than you, which is immoral, who knows what it is going to do and what it could come up with. But as I said, that is a subject which I guess we can continue to debate every six months from now as we touch in and see how AI is doing and whether the world is still surviving or not. Professor Domingos, such a pleasure talking to you as always. Thank you so much. Look, that entire theme about a super intelligent AI system getting out of control and wiping out people may sound like science fiction, but a lot of things that sound like science fiction can happen. So I guess that debate and discussion will have to continue because what analysts and critics will say is that, look, even if it's a 0.01% chance of something happening, if it is something that could lead to human extinction, you need to think about it, you need to debate it, you need to have safeguards. So we'll keep on talking about that.